Thanks very much, Ricardo. I just try to get, it looks good on my computer. Okay, so thanks very much for the invitation to come here. This is a great privilege and honor for me. And uh, what I want to do in, in the next half hour, I want to talk about three things. And I try to connect them, but I'm not so sure how good I con can connect them. First talk, of course, about Sergio and IFAC, easy to connect, yes? But then I have to really realize that uh, my own research and Sergio's have essentially, well, I wouldn't say zero overlap, <laughs> but uh, very little overlap, but I will do some constructing around that to, to, uh, to try to make a con connection. But certainly there is a deeper connection, and that is, uh, I very much appreciate you, Sergio, as a scholar, as a colleague, and also as a friend. And uh, I also want to show a couple of pictures, even so you will be disappointed, because many of them have already been uh, shown before. One is about the Riccati workshop, and I'm not going to mention anything more, just a nice picture. When I saw that, Sergio, I thought, wow, what a handsome man. And he still is so <laughs> very admirable. Um, of course, your contribution is really, really very diverse. You have been very active in UCA, you have been active in IEEE, and uh, fortunately to IFAC, you really have been very, very active in IFAC. And this is what I try to sketch now a little bit to give the timeline with a couple of pictures what he has been doing. So in 1984, so this was at a time when I just was an undergraduate student, he was already a member of the theory committee. In 89, we heard about the Riccati equation uh, workshop. And from then on, it essentially, it is a story of, uh, that, that continues on. He was chairman of the technical committee on adaptive control and learning from 1999 to 2002. And starting in 2002, he has become a member of IFAX Council, then being a member of the technical board. And this is a picture I'm especially proud of that I found it, because it's the only picture that I know of Sergio without a jacket. <laughs> And I don't think I have seen a picture today either with Sergio without a jacket. Then uh, 2008, 2011, that was before the Milano Congress. You were also a member of technical board and, of course, of the ad uh, administration and finance committee. And 2011, your masterpiece, uh, the organization, the orchestration, I would say, of the uh, Milan World Congress. But after that, it didn't come to an end. Uh, Sergio became vice president of, uh, of IFAC, um, and here is a picture that you have seen already before today. This was essentially when he ended his term, and uh, now in, in, uh, in, when we have been in Toulouse last week, he was appointed IFAC advisor, and so this is probably the newest picture that we can have uh, here. So here are a couple of more uh, impressions from, uh, from various occasions, and as you will easily see, Sergio always with, with a jacket. <laughs> so I try to make the connection now to research and uh, summarizing a little bit of uh, what my take is on your many research contributions. And there are different areas. One is control of time varying systems and the period periodic system seem to be one of your main things. And I wanna try to connect to that a little bit later on, uh, maybe with a di slightly different angle. So lots of very good publications in famous journals. Then of course, system identification, prediction and filtering. We have heard about that. Data analysis included data mining, which is nowadays especially a very important topic. And then, and I'm especially proud that I have discovered that, predictive and adaptive control. And there is a paper from 1990, from 1990, that's when I was not even aware that something like predictive control existed. There is a paper of uh, Sergio's on uh, the choice of horizon in long-range predictive co control. And uh, this is also what my talk essentially will be about. So <laughs> new research a uh, couple of uh, decades later. Um, so what I want to now do in the, in the next, uh, in the remaining time, I want to talk about a new direction in predictive control, uh, namely economic predictive control. It's really a change in the philosophy, and I think it relates also well to what Sergio has been doing. And considering how 
diverse the audience is, um, I this will be very basic and really focusing <coughs> on the various concepts. So I want to start out by reminding those of you, I know it's a very distinguished audience, and for some of you it's ridiculous to show again what MPC is, but the audience is really very diverse, so I just want to re um, repeat that. So in MPC, what we want to <laughs> do is we have a nonlinear ODE, it can also be a PDE, so there is lots of also research on PDEs can also be output feedback control. So we have a, a, a model of a system and we want to find a controller for that that satisfies a number of things. First of all, it should be stabilizing. That is the key requirement. Then it should satisfy an objective functional which is given usually as an integral. And what we want to achieve is to really achieve that over the infinite horizon. So that is our goal. Not a finite horizon, but over the infinite horizon. And maybe the speciality of MPC is that we can also take constraints on the inputs and the states and whatever into account in a fairly easy way. So this is a classical optimal control problem for which there are essentially two solutions. One is the classical closed loop optimal control theory as it was developed in the 50s and in the, in the 60s. So, uh, Hamilton Jacobi Bellman theory, Pontryagin's maximum principle, and we all know it's a great theory, wonderful, but it has a slight drawback, namely, it's a good theory, but cannot really be applied in practical situations, especially if you have constraints, then it's virtually impossible. The second solution that you could do is a local solution. You assume you know where you are, we know where we are, so if we don't want to find a global solution or a regional solution, but we say only for the state where we are we want to find a solution, then you can find easily an optimal an optimal open loop input trajectory that satisfies our, our optimization criteria. So that is really a solution then that you can compute, but it's not a feedback solution. So it doesn't have the nice properties like uh, stabilizing unstable systems, uncertainties, taking into account, and so on. Now, MPC is really the goal to combine those two worlds to find something that's computable, and that has all those nice uh, features of a feedback. And the idea behind it, as almost everybody here I'm sure knows already, is the repeated solution. So you solve that problem by repeatedly solving the open loop online, the, the open loop uh, uh, optimal control problem um, for one particular point in time, but then to implement it in such a way that you get a feedback. So you solve your infinite dimensional problem over the whole horizon, then you get a very long new trajectory but you're only applying the very first piece of that trajectory and discard everything else. You apply that, then you move forward, and then you measure again where you are, and uh, you, you get your a new, new state where you are. You compute again the whole thing, and uh, in this repeated way, you get feedback into the picture. Now, of course, an infinite horizon is a very long horizon, and so for computational purposes, and only for computational purposes, there is no other reason uh, to do something else is a finite horizon is used in that way. So the idea is essentially like in chess, you know, you think a couple of steps ahead, infinitely many makes no sense there, so you take 20 or 30, I don't know how many you use, Sergio, <laughs> maybe only 15 steps in the future, but you only implement your first step, then you wait what your opponent is doing, and then you reevaluate the game and look again over a certain horizon to the future and you continue like that. So the problem that is being solved, the open loop optimal control problem in discrete time looks like that. So we have a dynamical model of our system. We have a stage cost that plays a big role, and I will talk about that in a second anymore. Then we have those hard constraints that I talked about, about before. And then we have also a terminal cost and terminal region that play a very special role in MPC, and I will also talk about that in a second now. So this is the problem we are solving online at a given time, finding our solution, only using the first piece of the solution, and then repeatedly doing that. So what are the issues in MPC? Why is it an interesting technology? Well, first of all, it's non-trivial to really find such a, to compute such a so solution. You have to do that online and in a repeated fashion, so you have to do it very fast. And there is a whole bunch of research going on in that direction. But I guess what that crowd is much more interested in is the systems theoretic properties. So thinking about why does it work? Why is it a good solution? And in fact, if you think about it, or if you investigate it, you will immediately see it is not a good suggestion. 
So it is actually a methodology, if you don't do anything else, that will lead to instability. And there are many examples for that. Here is a fairly famous example, uh, because it's especially counterintuitive, uh, that goes back to Brims in, in the, the, the year 2000. Second order system, constructed second order system. And uh, you can see that this is the prediction horizon, how far you look into the future. And what, it's, what it does is, if you have a small prediction horizon, you have an unstable closed loop. If you increase your prediction horizon, it goes stable. And then it goes unstable again. And in fact, this repeats a number of times. So increasing your prediction horizon doesn't do what the experts here in the audience know. Long range, long, long range predictive control, is, it will not give you stability. It will give you stability if you're close to infinity. But this is, this is an academic example. But you can even show that it's destabilizing MPC with simple examples. So a Vortex system in our lab so this is really probably the most well-behaved and boring lab experiment that you can possibly have. But if you apply MPC to it, and if you choose the prediction horizon, not long enough. And here, not long enough means 60 seconds. So that's a long horizon, even for that system. So one would normally consider that things go well. It's destabilizing. Of course, it's not really very, very excitingly destabilizing. But here is the end of the tank that you have, so one of the tank is overflowing at that point in time. So even a boring, slow system like a four tank system, this standard MPC algorithm is destabilizing. So it's a really a, a not at all clear. And if it's not a particular matter of 60 seconds, if you increase the prediction horizon, it stays unstable. And only if you even double it, then you go to a stable system. So what's the difficulty of MPC altogether? Well, the biggest difficulty is at no point in time you have a controller. So you're only dealing with trajectories. You do optimization, you get a trajectory, but you have never a controller. So you can never plug the controller in. So you can never do an analysis in the classical way we do and analyze whether the system is stable. Neither by linearizing, looking at poles, nor by Lyapunov theory or something like that. You just don't have a U equals K of X at no point in time. And then you might think, okay, let's go for the trajectories. We have those trajectories. If they all point in the right direction towards the origin, probably things are okay. But there comes another difficulty. Those trajectories that you compute online are not the same as you will get later on in the closed loop. So they, are, they differ, and so you cannot even rely on those trajectories. So MPC is a very strange method in that you cannot really, if somebody gives you an MPC controller, analyze whether it's stable or not. <coughs> at least to, according to my knowledge, there is no simple way at least how to analyze a closed loop if somebody gives you an MPC controller. But there are ways how to find a closed loop and an MPC controller that is stabilizing, guaranteed of stabilizing. And there are two ways, namely that you choose your prediction horizon in a certain way long enough. This is called unconstrained model predictive control. This is a method that is actually only, I would say, the most seven or eight years old that people could really uh, do explicit computations on a precise uh, uh, on a precise horizon that is necessary. And the other alternative is really that you alter the problem setup in order to, to have a stable closed loop. And that is co what's called guaranteed stability in NPC framework. And there are many, many methods for that. And the idea really here is those terminal weights and the terminal constraints that you are having. So the idea here is if you choose, if you compute terminal constraints and terminal weights in the proper way according to various, there are various methods around, then you can guarantee that the result is stabilizing. If you then give the MPC controller to somebody and ask, then they would not be able to analyze it. But if you compute it in this way, then you know that the, the closed loop is stabilizing. So many schemes exist in that respect. And this is again the four tank problem that I showed before. Same prediction horizon as before, but now with one of those stabilizing constraints. And then it's, of course, stab stabilizing. Well, not surprising because it's proved that it's stabilizing. But just to show you that even with these short horizons, it will really work. Now, this is all about systems theory for MPC. And this was all old stuff. 
Now the new and the new exciting things here in MPC is really something that is going towards economic MPC. So far, stability was the main, main goal of this whole setup. So, so far, the, the goal was to have a set point and to stabilize the, the, the system around that set point. And for that to be, to, to be achievable, the cost function, maybe I can go back, the cost function, the state, stage cost here, had to be positive definite with respect to that point that you wanted to stabilize your system. So this is a key assumption that you have to make. And now, when you talk to pr practitioners, they all, always tell you MPC is a great method, really great method, and it's really applied in industry, but the thing they never really understood is why we have this stage cost. If you are interested in something, then you put it as a constraint, and then you know it's satisfied, but the state's cost is absolutely counterintuitive to choose, and what's typically done is choosing a quadratic stage cost with weightings one, or you modify, the, modify it by 10 or 100 or whatever, so that you get, a, get an average. So people there say this is very counterintuitive. Now, if you don't have to put it as a, as a positive definite function, if you can put it as something else, then it makes much more sense, and then then practitioners are much more interested. I mean, if you just write as the cost function, for example, euros that you want to earn, or energy that you want to minimize, or even a, a, a sum of various of these things, and not specify any, any working point at which you want to operate, but just what you want to achieve. Make money, or save energy, or save the environment, or whatever you, you want then this is a much more meaningful problem. And this problem is called economic MPC. So the idea is there not to pre-compute a steady state. Some steady state have disturbances hit you, and you insist on keeping that steady state. But you let the controller not only do the controlling, but also choose the right operating point for your system. So if you have, say, in a chemical reactor, a disturbance that you get more initial reactant into your reactor, then you make use of that and produce more product. In a classical controller, you would say, oh, bad, a disturbance. I have to get rid of this additional initial reactant. So this is the idea around uh, about that. And the key is really that the cost function is not positive definite anymore. And all the previous results I, sh I hinted at, I didn't show you any of them, that proved stability depended on the fact that you have a positive definite function uh, for the stage cost function. So you're giving away everything now that you have in MPC. We have no controller, we have no trajectories, and now the final thing that was used, I didn't show you exactly, in order to prove stability was the positive definiteness of the cost function. And it really plays a big role. You know, there are many things we heard about industry 4.0 already today. They are not interested in set point stabilization. They are interested in making money and operating a system in an overall optimal, in overall optimal way. And the same in, in the, the chemical industries where you really are interested in maximization of a product and not keeping a product at a certain stage. So this is a very interesting development. But now come quite a few other considerations into the play. Now, if the stage cost is a general cost function, anything, euros, so not positive definite, not specifying a set point of our system, so is the closed loop system convergent? Actually, what is the optimal operating range? Will it go to a steady state or will it even do something else? So it might very well be that uh, it will not just go to a steady state, but will fluctuate, and this is the optimal behavior. And again, in the chemical process control side, this is known since a long, long time. So in the 50s, there is quite a number of papers uh, by that very famous people, Amundsen, Aris, have worked on that, that the best way how to operate certain reactors is not doing it in a steady state manner, but that you really have an operation that can be either periodic or even non-periodic. And there, Sergio, there, this is the constructed connection that I have to you, <laughs> this mentioning of this periodic, and I will have one additional slide that I think I have never used in a talk before that I just put in with the result, uh, with the result for you. So now this is a new question, you know, and now 
the systems theory that we have to come up with here is not anymore do we want stability, but can we compute a priori what kind of behavior we have? Will we have something like that? Will we have periodic behavior or will we be going to a steady state? And this is the new systems theory for economic model predictive control. And I want to just give you a glimpse at that, realizing that uh, I'm the one between you and the end of today's talk, so I don't want to go over time. So the question of whether the optimal operation is at a steady state. This is a question that you can answer in a fairly good way. So first of all, I define what is the optimal operation at steady state. So x star, u star are, are vectors. Uh, constant vectors that we consider optimal steady state and we define them just as the minimum of our stage cost according to the constraints. So very typically it will be lying at some of the constraints and it being a steady state for our system. So just a definition, nothing fancy here. This is the, 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 the optimal steady state that you can have. And now the question whether the system is optimal operated at steady state. So whether this is the best way of, of uh, operating the system at a steady state. This is the equivalent to the following. If you take this optimal steady state, plug it into your stage cost, you get the best stage cost for your optimal behavior. And now if that is lower than any other behavior that you can have, so any other pair of dynamic UX movement potentially that you have averaged over your whole horizon, if that always, no matter what u and x you plug in, is a large, gives you a larger value, then obviously the steady state is the optimal one. So also still an obvious, so it doesn't require a proof, this. And now comes the interesting thing. Proving that this is indeed the case is now can be done. And this can be done with dissipativity theory. And uh, I have to say this was something very, very surprising to me. I don't have to explain dissipativity here. Um, so for certain supply rates that you can choose, if there exists a storage function such that the dissipation inequality is satisfied, you can prove certain properties. Um, S being zero, it's Lyapunov stability, you can prove L2 gain, passivity is a classical case of that. So many, many properties you can show. And now surprisingly, there also exists a supply rate with which you can prove whether such a system is optimally operated at steady state. And now, so the supply rate is very simple, namely the supply rate that you have to choose is just your stage cost minus the stage cost at the optimal operating point. And uh, indeed, there is, a, there is two results this direction, so that uh, the, the sufficiency of that result, of the existence of, a, of a, such a dissipation inequality that it gives you optimal operation at steady state, is a fairly simple proof, a three-line proof. So it's very, very nice. But and even more surprisingly, it's also a necessary condition under an additional assumption, but it's essentially a controllability, a type of controllability assumption. So the existence of the, the satisfaction of dissipation inequality is necessary and sufficient for this optimal operation. This is a very strong statement, a very useful statement. I will connect about that later. So, and it goes even further, if you go to strict dissipation inequalities, you can not only show that it is uh, uh, um, that it's necessary and sufficient, but you can also show that you converge then to that. So, this is the equivalent of the stability that we had before. The optimal operation will, will be a steady state and you will converge to it. So, this is all that you need. And now comes this slide that I inserted for you, searcher, you can also prove that periodic op operation is optimal. And I know that you worked on periodic systems that are periodic by themselves, but here this is a non-periodic system. It can be even a, 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 a non-time varying system, but still the operation, the optimal operation can be periodic. You have to just alter the dissipation inequality a bit and everything else carries through equivalently. So this is actually a very nice result because for MPC purposes, you, you know for sure that if your optimizer finds the optimal solution and it's a steady state, then you know that this is the optimal operation because it's a necessary and sufficient condition. Actually, the necessity gives you that, that, it's, that this is really indeed the best behavior and you know that you're converging to that. 
So it's a very strong and very intuitive statement for your system and the same holds of course also for periodic op uh, operation. You can do that also for disturbances and uh, in the case of disturbances it's actually much more interesting because optimal operating points that are really optimal as points may not be the optimal operating point uh, under disturbances. For example, in that case, if this is the cost function over, let's say, the state and you have a variation, a disturbance, then clearly an op operation at this point is much less optimal at this point. And so your MPC controller would even find that proper point and, and identify it as the optimal uh, point for operation. And there is a whole theory about it and you can, you can give bounce on the achievable performance and so on. So it's a really exciting new fields and everything is the last couple of years that we were talking about. So let me come to the con conclusion. So what I tried to convince you of in this short talk is uh, with economic NMPC, there are exciting new developments in receding horizon control and that go well beyond stability. Stability for economic NPC plays no role. It's a, a concept that has no meaning there at all. Um, and besides its practical relevance, its obvious practical relevance, there is really a systems theory for that and in fact a need for systems theory that needs to be developed. And I think, Sergio, this is another thing that you hopefully, or I think you will appreciate, that there is a theory and this is by, by the way also a picture taken in Toulouse. <laughs> So also a brand new picture. So this may be also uh, something that you appreciate. Non-steady state and in fact periodic operation turns often out to be more optimal than the steady state optimization. And I'm, that should be something that you really very much appreciate. And then maybe as a last statement that I want to make, MPC seems to be a field that is very long. You published in 1990 about MPC. There are even people that published in the 70s at MPC and it's never really getting old, uh, as many of here in the audience <laughs> seem to also very admirable. And Sergio, I very much hope, well, to, for the time being, this also holds for you, but I very much wish you that this will stay for the next years and even decades, so that in 20 years time you will be up at an equation like that and deliver talks and, uh, and entertain uh, the audience very much. So, thank you very much, Sergio for everything for being friends, scholars.